रामाय राम भद्राय रामचंद्राय वेद से रघुनाथाय नाथाय सीताये नम युद्ध कांड चैप्टर नंबर हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटीन डिस्कशन बिटवीन सीता एंड आंजनेय द रेसिटेशन बिगिन नाउ सो ऑर्डर्ड बाय राम द राक्षस गाइडेड द स्टेप्स ऑफ मारुति इन टू लंका He came upon the lady Sita in the women's apartments of Ravana. She was covered with dust all over. It was long since she had a bath. She sat in the Ashoka grove under a tree, listless and despairing, in the midst of the dreadful Rakshasas, like under Rohini in the grip of the planet Mercury. He drew near, announced himself, saluted her with reverence, and stood before her with his body, mind, and speech stilled. He folded his palms and then covered his mouth with his hand as a mark of obedience. She beheld him there, the mighty son of Anjana. Surprised thereat, she sat silent and still, and knew not what to think or do. Then she looked at him more carefully. His light and happy looks made her happy too. Marathi noted her face blossoming with joy at his presence there. He proceeded to give her in detail the message of Rama, Mother Vaidehi. Rama is all right, as also Sugriva, Lakshmana, Vibhishana, and all the monkey hosts. Ravana, the worst foe we had, is now no more. We have achieved our purpose here. They asked me to convey to you the good news of their well-being. Rama laid Ravana low in battle thanks to the help of Vibhishna the tireless efforts of the monkey hosts the keen dexterity of Lakshmana now Rama is happy since his wishes have been realized he ordered me to inquire of your well-being and says Janaki i bring you good and joyful news Ravana is no more he who was so cruel to you i shall do what will give you special pleasure You have been long away from me. I will take you back with me to Ayodhya. No one knows better than you the secret of devoted wifehood. All my efforts, and they were not slight, to overcome Ravana would have borne no fruit if you had not kept your hold on life. So it is, but the outcome of my good fortune that you managed to live on with unfaltering trust and love. You were in the grip of untold misery and fear all these terrible months. You had no assurance of my coming over here to take you back. Ravana begged and entreated, derided, flattered you, and spoke ill of me. Nay, he threatened your very life. Yet you never submitted to his will, but placed your trust and affection in me. Care, misery, and anxiety have left me never to return. Victory, unclouded and complete, has crowned me. Ravana is dead. and he was the last of our foes this lanka is ours to dispose of i vowed to rescue you from the hands of the foe i was anxious to make it good i went without sleep or food and have realized my purpose today i constructed a bridge over the waters feel no anxiety that you are in the house of ravana lanka and its riches and magnificence are vibhishnas so grieve not feel yourself at home Vibhishna will be here very soon to pay his respects to you. And this is Rama's message to you, dear mother. So spake Maruti, and Sita with her face like full moon in her joy, rose in haste and stood there mute, not knowing what to say or do. And Maruti, noting it, replied, "Lady, why do you not speak to me? What occupies your thoughts?" Sita the jewel of chaste and loyal womanhood was immensely pleased she said your words shook me with joy the news of the victory of my beloved lord swept me off my feet for a while i was beside myself with joy and could find no words my afflicted heart is now at ease and dances with delight as the waters of immortality soaked it I racked my brains for reply to him who brought me these glad tidings. My beloved child, I find nothing in all the universe to make a fitting return for all the joy and benefit I have received at your hands. Gold, silver, gems and everything that these worlds hold would be but a weak and pitiable reward. 
raising his folded palms above his head, Hanuman stood before her in meek humility and replied, Mother, noblest of women, you ever seek and pray for the good and the well-being and the victory of your Lord. Mere hearing of these words of yours full of affection is reward enough for me. I do not deserve such thanks at all. Who else but you can ever speak like this to me? Your reply is significant. You said, I find no ideas to couch the reply. This conveys the gracious thoughts of your boundless affection. It only lays bare what your heart feels towards me. My ears are blessed to hear it, and my heart is filled with joy, as if you have given me the most precious of all things in this world as my reward. The numerous heaps of gems, the lordship over the three worlds, all these pale into insignificance before your words. All of them which you were pleased to mention are already at my command. What are they by the side of the boundless joy which my heart feels when I behold Raghuvira in the majestic effulgence of his victory over the terrible Rakshasa Ravana? The daughter of King Janaka made a fitting reply, extremely happy and auspicious. Anjaneya, your words are free from the defects usually found in speech. They are blessed with every kind of excellence. They flood the heart with joy the moment they fall upon the ears. They reveal the intellect behind, adorned with eight kinds of perfection. And who else but yourself can speak so well? In addition to your matchless excellence as a speaker, you stand high in the glory of your mental and moral equipment. The daring son of Lord Vayu, you are ahead of him in the matter of enlivening all beings and gladdening their hearts. You are the fountain source of that grand law of life that enfolds all creation with such matchless compassion and mercy. Indefatigable exertion, perennial joy, delight in the battlefield, the wisdom of the ages, strength of body, valor, skill, power to overcome, patience and tolerance, forgiveness towards those that offend us, mighty effort, unshaken courage, noble modesty and many other excellent qualities cluster around you and glory in your luster. Do not harbor the thought that I flatter you with fancied excellences. Hanuman was not in the least elated by these words. On the other hand, he stood before Lady Sita with his folded palms on his head in reverence and said, Mother, these Rakshasis here are dreadful to look at, cruel by nature, fierce in looks and merciless in acts. Their words make our hearts quake with terror. Now, your Lord is a God. You have been cruelly torn away from his arms. Ravana has imprisoned you here in this Ashoka grove, and unspeakable misery has been your lot. Then these creatures reviled you, scolded you, frightened you, put you to shame, pained your ears with unseemly words, rushed at you as if to kill you. And I was a witness to all of it. No one else but I has a right to be enraged at these devils. No one had a chance to witness it, Rama, Lakshmana, Vibhishna, Sugriva, or the other monkey lords. So my heart hankers at dealing death unto all of them, and it is utterly uncontrollable, consuming desire. I pray you give me leave. This is the boon I seek of you. This shall be the reward to bestow on me. I would beat them till my hands ache. I would pound them with my knees. I would tear them to pieces. I would crush their ears and noses. I would pull out the hair by the roots, tear them to ribbons with my claws, smash their cheeks and jaws, jump down upon them from a great height, smash them on the ground and kill them with my fists. Are these not the demons that were guilty of boundless cruelty and torture beyond description? So I wish to put them to death with countless means of torture. This is absolutely necessary. Have these not been guilty of heinous offense against you? Patience, mercy and other noble qualities were the cause of the peerless fame of Sita, the world mother. She gave a reply worthy of the highest dharma. 
O oh, best and bravest of the monkey race, these are the servants of the king, his dependent, bound to obey his slightest commands, liable to cruel punishment if they disobey. Should one feel offended by the acts of these slaves of Ravana? Why waste your breath upon these? I must have wrought evil in some past birth and have reaped the result in this birth in the shape of these miseries. I reap what I sowed. Why blame them? It was destined that I should suffer thus, and these are but the instruments. I have thought all this before, reached this conclusion, and reconciled myself to it. I was powerless then to prevent the suffering. I cannot bear to see others suffer. And how can I see these suffer? Compassion held my hands back then. It does so even now. Were I minded to kill them, could I not have consumed them to ashes then and there? Do I need your help for this? If these practices treated me cruelly, it was by the orders of Ravana. Now that he is dead, it is far from their thoughts to trouble me now. Even if these were independent and offended me of their own accord, it is up to us to bear with them. Once upon a time, a hunter was hotly chased by a tiger, and he saved himself by climbing up a lofty tree that stood welcomingly near. But lo, there was a huge grizzly bear sitting on his branches. The man, in utter despair, threw himself on the mercy of the hairy monster and cried, I place my life in your hands. Do with me as you will. Fear not, replied the bear. The tiger shall not come at you. Later on, the hunter was overcome with sleep and the bear allowed him to rest his head on its lap. Then the tiger called out to the bear and said, Friend, we are of the same kind. We live in the same forest. We have our joys and sorrows in common. But this is a man, a hunter by profession and our sworn enemy. He makes his living by killing us. He is not of our kith and kin. We have nothing in common with him. The moment he is safe from my clutches, he will forget everything that he owes you and will soon return your kindness by seeking to kill you. Throw him down to me, we will share him. Then the bear, out of the generosity of his nature, sternly replied, Enough of this. What treachery and baseness! He who seeks me out and craves my protection is my honored guest. If I should place myself on a level with you, and traitorously hand him over to your tender mercies, the finger of scorn would be ever pointed at me as a monster of wickedness, as a wretch that betrayed him that sought a shelter with me. Nay, the holy books say that an eternity of nameless woe in the deepest and darkest hells is the portion of such ingrates. Soil my ears no more with such foulness. Soon after, the hunter awoke, and the bear, feeling tired and sleepy, laid his head on his lap and fell into a profound slumber. Then the tiger called out to him and said, Fool, you sought to escape me, didn't you? A nice person have you pitched upon to protect you. Maybe you belong to the same species. Maybe you live together. Maybe he is your dearest friend. The fool that you are? Know you not that he is a deadlier enemy to you than myself? You have played into his hands nicely and placed your head between his jaws. He only waits for me to leave this place to crush your poor bones to powder. Now be wise and take heed in time. Throw him down to me while he is heavy with sleep. It matters very little to me whether you or he goes to relieve my pangs of hunger. Look sharp and neither of us will be worse for it. Alas, man, frail man, listened to the words of the tempter and fell. Distrust of the noble bear grew upon him apace and without a pang of regret, he threw him down to the tiger. But beneficent providence slept not. The bear awoke as it fell and by an instinctive moment caught at a branch and swung himself up to his seat. Then horrible fear overcame the traitor and he gave himself up for lost. But the noble beast read his mind like an open book and said to him with a smile, Good man, fear not. Far be it from me to seek to go back upon my plighted word. At once the wily tiger turned the situation to his advantage and cried out, Friend, see you not that I was a true prophet? 
Now it needs no ghost to tell you that your protege is a demon of ingratitude. If you have not taken leave of your senses, you will at once throw him down to me. And to him spake back the bear. It is in the nature of things for fire to scorch, for water to drown, for scorpions to sting, for cobras to kill. A wicked heart ever asserts itself, but no one who walks the path of righteousness ever dreams of taking offense at it. He would not place himself on the same level by seeking to pay back ingratitude with injury. To me, my life is as naught when placed against my plighted word. Truth is the brightest jewel that ever shines on the head of the righteous. He closed his ears to every argument that the tiger used to drag him away from his purpose and watched over the safety of the hunter that lived long night until the tiger slunk away from the spot in sheer despair. Now, Anjanea, you would be the last person to advise me how to behave less nobly than a beast. He who does us good is entitled to our love, to our gratitude, even to the fullest, is it not? But equally so, if not more, is he who seeks to harm us. It is no great boast that we seek to return good for good, but to return good for evil is something worth doing. Now, take this view of the case. If every being in the universe were to sin and go against the good law, then sin is no name for it. Now, can you point out to me anyone who has not sinned? If so, he is welcome to judge the others and punish them. Let him that is pure, let him that is perfect, sit in judgment over the guilty. It is my honest conviction that the wide world holds none such. All have broken the sweet harmony of nature or will. All deserve to be judged and punished. And then, it is no crime and it is no punishment. Hence, I say unto you, there is no wrongdoing in this world. The Rakshasas take shapes and forms at will. Cruelty is the badge of their race. Torturing others is supreme delight to them. So it is no wonder that they commit sins. Yet one should do them no harm. Hanuman, with his penetrating intellect, avidly grasped the principle that lay behind her words. She was the mother of the universe, famed for her unbounded mercy. She was the fitting mate of the Supreme Lord, so he said. Mother, you are no other than the honored helpmate of Raghunatha. The principle of giving refuge which he relentlessly practices is rendered doubly glorious by your good self. All the fame that crowns him comes through you, does it not? You are the fit companion of his. So permit me to leave and send a reply to Raghava through me. I shall go back to him. And to him said Janaki, O oh, best of the monkey race, I yearn to see and pay my obeisance to my lord and husband. Those words magnified the resplendent luster of Anjanea, and he cried, Mother, the face of Sri Rama, shining like the full moon, brings the peace and sweetness of immortality to the heart of the onlooker. You are to be blessed with the sight of his divine face as he abides there in the company of Lakshmana. He is effulgently radiant with the triumphant victory over his foes and in the company of his friends, Sugriva, Vibhishna and others. You are to behold him even as Indrani beholds Indra. Immediately the form of Sita shone with magnificent splendor like Mahalakshmi herself. And Anjaneya sped back with alacrity to the presence of Rama. Mangalam Koshalendraya Mahaniya Gunamte Chakravarti Dhanurjaya Sarva Bhumaya Mangalam.